G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Anne-Marie Hayek from Global Mosaic, based in Chicago, United States. Thanks for your time today, Anne-Marie. So good to be here. Thanks, Troy. Let's start with how we know each other. So Gunnar from Scribe uh, thought you might be a good guest to come on. They help uh, business owners and, and potential authors write books. And we've had a few guests on from, from Scribe who have worked with Scribe. So really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's thrilling to be here. The book comes out in a week and a half, so we're a bit crazed, but super, super excited about it. So that's a, it, mid-August, so it should, it'll be out by the time this is live. So maybe talk a little bit about the title and what the book's about. Absolutely. So it is called Generation We, The Power and Promise of Gen Z. It is about Generation Z, which for those who are listening have probably heard increasingly about Gen Z in the media. Yeah, this isn't the Brad Pitt zombie movie, is it? (laughs) It is not. It is not. No, important to differentiate between the two. So Generation Z is the generation that follows the millennials. We've all heard uh, probably more than we need to about the millennials over the last 15 years or so. This is the generation that follows them, which are roughly 10 to 23 years old and um, very distinct from the millennials. There is... uh, there was a lot of miscommunication about them really just being a younger version of the millennials, which they are not at all. They um, And what had mostly been written about them was fairly superficial. It was focused on their media obsession. Mm-hmm. I think we all talk, we think about young people, we think about them being glued to their phones all the time. We think about them being on TikTok, uh, obsessed with dance videos and memes and things like that. Um, you know, maybe we hear about their cancel culture, which is criticized. Um, but there's a much, much deeper story about them and their involvement and um, ideas and critical um, inputs into some of the most critical issues of our day, yep. which they're taking a leadership role in. So this book is really around the roots of their power and the coming impact that they'll have. So that's important for business owners from a marketing perspective to understand this new cohort coming into the market over the next five or 10 years, really. Absolutely. And again, they're very different from millennials. And so it's important to understand who's coming. And they actually have now surpassed millennials as the largest generation in the world wow. and um, and are well on track to surpass millennials in terms of spending power in the next decade, by the end of this decade as well. Okay. Wow. That's very interesting. Yeah. Tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. Sure. So my business, Global Mosaic, I founded 19 years ago. It is a cultural consultancy, which oftentimes people ask, well, what is a cultural consultancy? And I say, well, I made it up because when you're an entrepreneur, you get to create your business, and you get to create what you want to name it and what you <laughs> want to do. And so, um, and so what a cultural consultancy is, is we help companies, we help entities, we've helped presidential candidates understand culture, understand cultural movements, understand cultural trends, understand how people's lives are evolving understand how different uh, industries are evolving, you know, how the health and wellness trajectory is evolving, how work is evolving. I mean, post COVID, we've been doing a lot of, Mm. a lot in that space, right? What does the future of work look like? Um, Gender, how gender is evolving, Mm. right? What that looks like. If you're a fashion company, a clothing company, how are you thinking about masculinity and femininity, right? And the fluidity between those things. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of work in the gender space, whether it be how boomers are approaching aging, how millennials are changing, what adulting looks like, and now a lot of work in the Gen Z space because they're really the most powerful generation coming on the scene now. Yeah, right. And how did you start out? And then what I was just going to add is, so Global Mosaic is 19 years old, and then I founded Z Speak, which Mm -hmm. is a second company specifically to focus on Generation Z because we feel that they're so important that we really wanted an entire team of people that was focused just on that generation. And that was a COVID baby. Right. That actually found, <laughs> founded that in, in May of, of 2000. And what happened, right? We were all at home and um, I was no longer traveling East, West Coast, London, yeah. all over the place every week. And so I had time. So I thought, what will I do? I will create a second company. 
So it was May 2020, um, a bit over a year ago. Yeah. May 2020, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. And have doing been doing research ever since. And um, and the book is 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 one of the outputs of that. Yep. Um, so how do we make money? We are our consultancy. Um, and so we have both ongoing relationships with companies and we do project, uh, you know, project, you know, with a more definitive time frame. Yep. Um, and we work with everyone from some of the largest companies in the world to fast growing startups to, as I said, um, up to uh, presidential candidates. We are working right now. Now, now we're working with universities. Um, who are interested in understanding how they need to think differently about education to cater to Gen Z, to this new growing um, generation who are entering all of our universities, um, to mayors who are asking, what do Gen Z really want? Do they really want to defund the police? Yep. What do they really want, right? So we really work across all those industries. And... That's great. So in 2002, when you started up Global Mosaic, how old were you when you decided to make the jump? I was 31 years old. Yep. (laughs) And I had been working, I had spent the first decade of my career working for big marketing advertising agencies uh, like Publicis, uh, Leo Burnett, BBDO, you might be familiar with those. Yep, huge. And I was in I was in global roles, right? So I literally lived on four continents, um, led research across more than 50 countries, um, anthropological work, really. So it was helping all of our big clients from Procter & Gamble and Kellogg's and McDonald's and you name it, understand culture, mm-hmm. understand how people lived, how people ate, how people cared for themselves, how they did laundry, whatever it was, right, in all these different countries, um, so that they could expand into these geographies, they could create innovation for these geographies, etc. So I was always involved in culture, and have always really been passionate about um, humans, Mm. how humans live, how humans live in different places, right? how they think differently, how they behave differently, how their priorities are different. So um, that was really fascinating to me, but I, I got to a point and I'm incredibly blessed to have had that experience because I got, I was essentially, you know, my initial companies funded those first 10 years of my life and allowed me to live all over the world on their, on their dime um, and really deeply, deeply dive into culture. Right. Yeah. And really learn how to do anthropology. Right. Um, in a very practical way. But what I didn't love about it is I didn't love all the project, all, all of the projects. Honestly, I didn't necessarily love that, uh, you know, I was part of efforts to convince Chinese children who were eating vegetables for breakfast to eat sugared cereal for breakfast, right. for example. Yeah. So after 10 years, I felt, I think I've taken what I am to take from this experience and I'm really ready now to start my own company, or I hoped I was ready to start my own company, where I could really focus on culture, but take the projects that I was passionate about that really involved working with companies and organizations who wanted to authentically understand culture, and then organically create products and services that serve those populations, instead of just trying to you know, create, create uh, selling points for existing products. Got it. Yeah. And do you have some key numbers to illustrate the growth of the business over the 19 years? Well, it's it's funny because I still remember it's it's scary, right? I'm sure everybody who probably comes on your podcast talks about this, that mm-hmm. it's really scary when you first hang that, you know, uh, shingle out, yeah. hang that shingle out fi- 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 figuratively. Yep. And um, I still remember, you know, my first project, I remember uh, my profit on that was $14,000. And I remember being so excited to earn that $14,000. Within three years, we were doing over a million dollars of revenue. And we've just been growing since then. That's great. With, with this year, with the launch of Z Speak. And with the excitement around the book, our publisher expects we'll make it Amazon bestseller, which fingers crossed we will, but it feels like we're really hitting at the right time where everyone is talking about Gen Z right now and every company is wanting to understand who they are and what that means for their business. Um, so I'm just rapidly, rapidly hiring at this point. And um, we're turning down about 80% of the business is coming our way right now because we just can't, we can't handle okay. it all right now. Yeah, you're so gonna we're, get- we're in a huge growth phase right now. So starting out FTE was just yourself and what, what would you, it number, was number of FTE now across the two businesses, how many team members full-time? Um, right now we have 10 full-time people. Mm-hmm. So we'll probably be double that 
a year from now. Um, But I also have to qualify that for me, um, size was never the uh, size was, 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 was never really my primary goal. I guess my goal was to take on only the projects that we really wanted to take on that we felt that we could make the kind of impact that we wanted to make. Um, And I like for myself and my business partner, who's equally senior to be able to at least touch all the projects that we're working on. And so it's not actually unusual that we're turning down 50 plus percent of the projects that come our way. In my mind, some of that is just quality control and that we really get to work on the projects we want to and with the people that we want to. Yeah. And, and importantly on that quality issue, obviously, is also making sure that you hire the right people. Um, you don't want to grow too fast and hire too fast and bring on B or C players. Absolutely. And because we're working with C-level clients at companies, because we're working with senior politicians, because we're working with, right, it has to be the right level of people. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a challenge now because mm. on my Z-Speak team, I have all Gen Zs. So my <laughs> eldest employee on the Z-Speak side is 24 years old. Wow, just and made the Z cup, yeah. And that 24-year-old has direct access to CEOs and founders. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so it's finding the right people yep. who are able to do that at that age, right? Yes. We'll get to people and culture in a minute, but um, <laughs> when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? So I mentioned that I started my career before I founded Global Mosaic, working for large marketing and advertising companies. And my very first job was at Leo Burnett, based in Chicago, which is owned by Publicis in Paris. And um, so I was 22 years old, fresh out of undergrad. And I... uh, you know, was fairly intimidated by this big granite tower in downtown Chicago. And there was an executive floor, which really no one, no one 22 year old, 22 years old was ever invited to the executive floor. So after I founded my company, a couple of years into founding my company, I was invited, my company was invited by Leo Burnett to come lead an immersion into the millennial generation on the executive floor for executives. Wow. <laughs> and I remember walking into that executive conference room filled with about a hundred people from Leo Burnett with my presentation projected on the screen with my corporate logo. <laughs> and I was in my mid, I was in my mid thirties. And yeah. I thought, you know, I was here 14 years ago, had yeah. no access to this floor. And now I'm presenting to them. And for the audience, for context, Leo Burnett's one of the l- largest advertising agency founded by Leo Burnett, obviously. And it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from him, which is when you reach for the stars, you may not quite get one, but you won't come up with a handful of mud either. That's so impressive that you know that, Troy. Oh, absolutely. That's Leo Burnett's most favorite quote, the man yep. himself. Oh, I did remember it, but I had to Google the exact words just then as you were <laughs> that. that was impressive. It, yeah. Yeah. Very impressive. Absolutely. What what does success look like to you? So it evolves over time, right? And so when I founded it at 31, at that time, success during my 30s looked like me being able to do the work that I wanted to do in the world. And I think that one of the things that is very much true about me is I know that there are entrepreneurs who will say that they identify the opportunity for their business by... uh, by analyzing the market, identifying the market opportunity, the green space opportunity, the unmet need, whatever it might be, um, which is an externally driven way, right, to identify a business need, create a business, 100% valid. I'm very much a heart-led person. I'm very much a passion-driven person. So everything I've always created has been internally driven. So it has really been what do I love to do? What do I wish I could do in the world? How would I love to spend every day of my life? And so for me, when I started Global Mosaic at 31, all I wanted to do was create a business where I could study culture Mm -hmm. in a way that felt impactful and work with organizations and companies to make the kind of impact that I wanted to make. At the time, it was things like, you know, helping a company to create a whole natural health division, right? Or whole sustainability practice or whatever it was that was really forward, forward thinking. Um, As I entered my 40s, I had children. And so then it really became, wow, as an entrepreneur, how can I establish work-life balance so that I can really 
uh, expose my children to the kind of life that I would like to expose them to. And as a global strategist, as somebody who leads anthropology and is fascinated by culture, what that meant is that I took my kids about three out of 12 months out of every year traveling the world. Wow. Mm. And I did that while working Yep. because I had global projects. There was one point when they were in second and fourth grade, when I had a project I was working, I was doing a lot of work in China at the time and they were studying Mandarin in Chicago. And I thought, why don't we just go live in China for a semester? That's so we right. did. Yeah. And so that was the definition of success now. Now I just turned 51 years old. And for me with Z-Speak and this book, it really is about creating more of a legacy. I think that Generation Z really has a lot of ideas and is a much more collaborative generation that is really looking to solutions to a lot of the systems and flaws in our, in our, in, in, in our society, in our systems um, that can really make a positive impact. And so now success looks like... Um, Helping companies, right? Helping us as a society to understand and listen to this younger generation and be open minded um, and work more collaboratively to come up with solutions that can serve all of us. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business? To marketing a fast growing business. You know what I would say? I'm going to answer this maybe non traditionally. I think that a key theme for me is, is humanity. <laughs> and, uh, and I had, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but, but the people within my company know that if there is a motto within my company, it is CFH, which stands for crazy fucking human. <laughs> and so I don't like to be overly corporate. I don't like to be overly, of course we are professional, mm. but we're humans. We're humans first. We're humans before we're business people. We're humans before we're clients. We're humans before we're service providers. And so I ask everyone in my company to show up as crazy fucking human every day. Um, and so for me, I really feel that when we work with clients and we show up as crazy fucking human, which means that we show up authentically, we speak truthfully about what we believe, about what we think, um, we challenge, we, we do the work to authentically uncover human insight and to help them understand our human evolution, right? In all these different areas in terms of our cultural trends and movements, et cetera. And I feel that when we show up as crazy fucking human and we make those connections with our clients, those bonds that we forge are so strong. Mm. And so that's the best marketing. You know, we, of course, we've had websites forever. We have social media, we post, we, we, we publish research we're doing publicly. We do all of those things. And you know how we get business? We have clients that come to us. We have CMOs that we've never worked with who come to us and say, I put out a question to my community and five different people recommended Global Mosaic. Wow, that's powerful. Right? From, from different countries, from different organizations, because those connections are so deep, because we're, we're coming together as humans and we're, and, we're, and, we're, and we're solving problems together, right? In a very real way. And how did you fund your business? So because I started small, I had savings um, that sustained me that those first six months. But honestly, I have to say, and I think this comes back to, I have, think I've always been crazy fucking human. So, <laughs> so I, had, I, had, I had strong relationships. And yeah. so when I, when I started the business, when I hung that, that you know, shingle, as they say, um, immediately had business. And within the first year was hiring people. And, you know, within three years, um, brought on a business partner. We yeah. can talk about that. That's, you know, that was one of the most challenging parts, I would say. Most yeah. one of the most scary things early on. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we were generating our own revenue so early on, it really wasn't an issue. And as a consultancy, we didn't need to, we didn't need to generate the kind of money to produce or to yep. purchase, right? Yeah. So Back no... No bank finance or other investors, just a business nope. partner. Yep. Correct. Um, do, maybe do you want to touch on that for a little bit, you know, how you went through that process of identifying the right business partner and any uh, advice for those listening? Yeah, I think it's hard for, for people listening who, well, really, I feel like almost anybody, right, who starts a business, if you're the founder, you know this as well. Mm. If you're the founder, you have the vision. It 
it is your baby. (laughs) It is your baby. Right. And, and, and as a consultant who consults all of these big companies and brands all over the world, I also know as a branding expert, right. That for any brand to be successful, for any company to be successful, it needs to have a very clear single-minded vision. It needs to have a very clear single-minded point of view, a very clear single-minded point of differentiation. And so my worry was I had such a clear vision for what this business was. But a couple of years in, when I decided I absolutely had to bring on a partner and expand, um, how was that going to work? How mm. was I going to bring in someone? And I ended up hiring a partner who was senior to me. Right. Who had incredible, right, who was running uh, strategic planning departments and SVP level at all these major companies um, in the marketing and advertising space. Um, and it was actually a couple of years senior to me. And my concern was, how can I maintain this very, you know, single minded vision and clarity as to who we were and the direction that we were headed by bringing in this other senior person? What if this other senior person had different ideas? Were we going to become diluted in terms of mm. what we were or what we wanted to be? Um, and it turns out that that was really unfounded in my case, yep. because what I've really learned over time, and I don't like to think of myself as a control freak, yep. uh, definitely not a control freak, but I would say that there are elements to any entrepreneur yep. that <laughs> we are controlling, right? We yes. are controlling because we are we are, we are are creating the parameters of our business, right? And what's in bounds and out of bounds. That's how awesome Absolutely, well. absolutely. And so what I've really learned though is when you bring the right people in, that they didn't, they didn't detract at all from the vision. They mm-hmm. contributed to the vision. And the other thing is they, I would say, honestly, in my case, that they, they do defer to me to some degree because the reason they were attracted to the business and to be part of these businesses, both Global Mosaic and Z-Speak, is because they already really bought into the vision. Yeah. Because I had clearly defined what the vision was, they were drawn to the companies because they wanted to operate and to continue to build that vision, not to challenge it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Absolutely. A hundred percent. I have had the time of my life. Hmm. I wake up every morning and think, this is my life. I have created this. Mm-hmm. I get to do this today. Um, and I actually have a little, a little, a little anecdote too, a very personal anecdote. But uh, again, for those of us who have kids, we are, we learn from our kids every day, right? It doesn't matter how successful we are at work. We learn so much from oh, our kids. Oh, Yep. Oh my God. We are like the students in there, the teachers every day, right? And uh, and when my eldest was a an adolescent, it was like an opening, you know, first day of school kind of thing, parent teachers, students, Mm -hmm. everybody there. And the teacher was trying to make the point to these adolescent students that it's okay to be going through puberty, to go be going through puberty and to be changing because we all change all the time. All of us change every year, right? So we all had to go around the classroom. We all had to say, what's one way that we are different now than we were one year ago. And all of these, you know, 11 year olds, 12 year olds had no issue saying, Oh, I learned how to do, you know, a a backflip in gymnastics. I learned how to do this or that or the other thing, right? And the adults had the hardest time <laughs> explaining how they were different now than they were one year ago. And people said things like, well, I got bifocals. I didn't have bifocals a year ago. And I thought, this is the most fucking depressing conversation. I've ever had. <laughs> and I never want to be yeah. an adult who can't explain how I'm different now than I was one year That's ago. That's right. I love that. Mm. Right? And so I feel like that is an entrepreneur as well, mm. is that we grow every year. And so our business grows and evolves every year because if it's really an extension of who we are, we are bringing more of ourselves and more of our own personal evolution to it. And that's really why I founded Z-Speak because I wanted to continue to grow and evolve. And this was a generation I was so fascinated in. At 51 years old, I'm publishing a book for the first time. Yep. That mm. my publisher expects to be an Amazon bestseller. Mm. Fantastic. That was scary, right? Mm. But I can say, what did I do this year that I've never done before? I wrote a freaking book, right? <laughs> that's right. So, I mean, that's really inspired by these 11 and 12 year olds. I yeah. always remember that lesson from that day. Yeah, brilliant. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Well, interesting. I feel like we've actually already talked about that. That really was that transition of bringing in bringing in a full fledged partner and how yeah. that was going to work in terms of the vision and not diluting the vision. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most at the greatest value? 
I think that one of the, I think, well, I, there, there are two things that I would say. Um, and, 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 and one is, and you may hear entrepreneurs say this a lot, but I think that, I think that people cannot hear this enough, um, is that we all have, we are all our own worst bully, right? And I will say, and I, I've, I, I said this recently on another podcast as well, in just, again, showing up and being crazy fucking human, is they asked what I learned from writing the book. And I said, I said, I have to be really honest. Writing this book was so incredibly hard because I wrote it during COVID and it was dark and it was isolating. Mm. And I had to get out of bed every single morning and I had to get on my computer and do my research and write. And you know, it showed up every single morning. You know who got out of bed every single morning with me was that inner bully who said, who are you to write a book? Yep. You mm. think you can write a book? <laughs> And the more time that went on, instead of the bully going away, the bully voice got stronger. Then it started to say, you've now wasted six months of your life writing this book. What if it's all shit? Right? And so and so, the hardest part, because I'm actually a good writer, right? I'm a good researcher. I've done a lot of good work in the world. Um, But it is that inner bully always shows up. And so so that has been, I mean, that has been one of the things for sure, is just learning how to slay that inner bully every single day. The other thing that's been huge to me that I would say that has been really like a mindset shift is, um, is that I think that for those of us who are smart, for those of us who were told we were smart when we were growing up, Um, for those of us who did well in school, you know, for those of us who've been successful, um, we have been celebrated for our brains. We've been celebrated for our strategic minds. We've been celebrated for our problem solving abilities. And so we learn to default completely to our heads and we become almost like these stick bodies with these giant heads that we rely on for everything. Right. Right. And what I've really learned over time is that oftentimes the answers are not actually in our heads, but they're really in our hearts. Yep. And so what I, there, there were times in the business where we were taking on way too many projects and a lot of them made sense in my head and in my partner's head. It makes sense for us to take on this project because it will help us expand into this new category. It makes sense because it will allow us to build this relationship with these important people whatever it might be. But the reality is taking on those projects made us feel nauseous in our hearts because we were overworked. We weren't that passionate about that particular industry or that particular project or whatever it might be. And so about four years ago, I made a really significant shift where I decided and within our team and with my partner, I said, we are going to make decisions now that are not just head driven, but are they also heart driven. Mm-hmm. So when we have a new opportunity come in, sure, let's talk about if it makes sense for the business. And then let's sit with it and think, how does this feel? Does it feel good? Are we excited to take this on? Or do we feel nauseous about taking this on? And if we feel anything but passion and excitement for this project, we're not taking it. That's good. Yeah, that's really good. Everyone and it's been, a, it's been a huge, huge shift. And frankly, that's a lot of what made sense for Z-Speak and for this direction we're going now with um, Gen Z. because that is work that we're passionate about. And so we continue to take on more and more work with that generation, which then just continued to build into this entirely new company and this whole new opportunity. What have you enjoyed the least about managing fast growth? Hmm. It's a good question. It really is when we have taken on too much work, when we haven't been heart led, when we're doing work that isn't the work that we're passionate about. I would say too, for me as a business owner, increasingly, and this might sound woo woo and soft, (laughs) but it's a hundred percent the truth for me is I meditate every day. Mm -hmm. And I find as a business owner that is absolutely critical to meditate every morning because it centers me on why I'm doing this work, why I'm running these businesses, what my priorities are, and what I need to let go. Because on any given day, there are probably 100 emails that I'm not going to get to. Yeah. 
And so I need to know before I go into that day. Otherwise I end up feeling like a, you know, ping pong ball, just yeah. being tossed, tossed around all day long. And it, it's a fortunate position to be in and that we're so in demand right now. Right. But I need to center every morning and really decide to be incredibly intentional and only focus on the things that really matter to us. What do you love most about growing a small business? I love when we're able to make an impact. We just, we just this week, for example, the book isn't even launched yet, right? And um, just, well, this just happened literally in the last 24 hours. A major university in the US came to us and said, and we've, we've worked in the past mostly with businesses, sometimes with governments. Um, in the last 24 hours, a major university in the U.S. came to us. This is even advanced of the public uh, of the book actually publishing, right? But just in reading some of the PR and having a sense of what the book uh, what the book is about and our expertise in in the Gen Z space, a major university in the U.S. came to us and said, "We want you to come and to speak to us and become a consultant to us because we know that we need to evolve how we do things." how we think about diversity and inclusion, how we think about sustainability, how we think about who we are in the world and how we serve this next generation of students. That's right. Yeah. And I thought that is why we're doing this. Yeah. And that was just in the last 24 hours. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Mindset. We, I think we've covered off the mindset shift question. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? I think it is finding a way to remain centered on your initial intention. Because once you become successful, you can become that ping pong ball that's just tossed around. Mm. And so you 100% need to remain focused on your initial intention and your initial vision. And there are different ways to do that. I not only meditate every day, I have a vision board that I keep in my office, right? That is really focused on, it says impact at the top, and it represents, right, visually and through words, et cetera, the kind of work that I most want to do this year. And am I moving in that direction? And is that the kind of work that we're doing? For different people, being true to your initial intention and vision looks different, and there are different ways for them to do that. For some people, it might, ha- it might be keeping their mission or their vision or whatever, however they articulate that, right, in huge letters above their workspace. It can be done different ways, but I believe so much that as an entrepreneur, if you're going to be successful, it gets back to the conversation we had at the very beginning. You can either be internally driven or you can be externally driven. And I think to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to always be internally driven. You always need to know where your heart is and what your vision is and what you're trying to create in the world, because the world will try to co-opt it. (laughs) The world will try to take it and create it into what it wants it to be. Or as you become more successful, there are so many opportunities that you could just go off on all these tangents and lose yourself and lose your original vision. Definitely. Yeah. It's play or or your all your energy and resources all over the shop. And and that's it. That's it. And then you do all your energy, all your resources, your money, everything, right? Do you love talking small business growth with other owners? We have a vibrant online community from many industries around the world. Plus, we regularly add new tools and resources for community members and host two webinars a month to help you grow your small business. GrowSmallBusiness.com Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? You know what's interesting is I used to recruit based on skills. Mm Mm-hmm. It was all about skills. I need you to have these skills, this experience level, have having done this kind of work. It's two now, things I look for, <laughs> attitude and aptitude. Right. But now after 19 years, what mm. I find is most important is really their passion mm-hmm. and is their creativity. Right. Yep. Because so much of what we do, right, is really around imagining the future Mm-hmm. And we're a very entrepreneurial, nimble, small organization. And I need people who are going to show up every day full of ideas on what we can create and what we can do for our clients and the skills they can learn. But the attitudinal disposition yep. toward passion and creativity, mm. you can't teach anybody. Exactly. It's got to be innate. Yeah. Yep. What are some things you'd recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? 
I think being really, really clear. And again, a theme from this interview is probably humanity, right? And I think I think that there's been, again, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a cultural expert, right, who specializes in cultural evolution. We've seen work culture evolve so much during my life. My first job I took in 1992. I'm now 51 years old, right? In, in, in 1992, you showed up in a suit <laughs> yeah. and you reported to the man mm-hmm. and you didn't question authority. Mm-hmm. And there were, you know, very, you, you held your tongue. And now I think we've really evolved to a place where people show up and want to show up as their whole selves at work. Mm. Yeah. And so, and so for me, I don't have a complicated, um, I don't have a complicated code for our culture It's really allowing people to show up as their full selves every day. And I listen. And what I do on my Z speak team, for example, is I said, my, my oldest employee is 24 years old because it's important to me that that entire company is run by Z's. Yes. Right. With my oversight. But what I do is I take them out for drinks. (laughs) I take them out for drinks and I just listen. And I listen to them talk about their lives and I talk about them. I, I, you know, I listen to them talk about their dreams Mm -hmm. and I listen to them talk about their generation and I listen to them talk about their ideas and what we can build and what they would love to build and why they would still love to be working for this company in five years. And I just listen Mm. and I just let them be human. I let them talk and I let them be 24 years old and have dreams And then I get to leverage that and we get to leverage that passion, right? And we get to build that into what we become over time. And so that's really what the culture I think is about is allowing people. I think in 2021, it's really allowing people to show up as their whole selves and really listening to them. It's no longer for me now when I'm hiring people, it's no longer creating a very, very, very specific job description and a silo that they then need a box that they then need to fit within. It's mm-hmm. finding the right person. And then it's really giving them the space to show up as their, as their whole self with a lot of passion um, and help us really build what we're building in whatever way they are inclined to do so. Hello audience, how you've handled balance. Well, I'm not handling balance particularly well right now. <laughs> you come back in a week and you can <laughs> With the book launching in a week and a half, yeah. I'm doing lots of podcasts and lots of interviews, and and uh, there's there is a lot going on right now. In addition to running the two companies that I'm running, so so if I'm to be perfectly honest and completely CFH right now, I'm working seven days a week, and uh, you know, and pretty much every waking hour. Um, but but um, once I get past this phase. You know, so we certainly need to get back to a place of balance. I mean, I think I, I, I will admit it's not my strength. It's not my strong point. It mm. is not my, I'm not, I'm not the poster child for life work balance. And I think, <laughs> I think though part of it is because my work, my work and my life are so fused Yeah. because I continue to create companies and to create, uh, to create work that is so much an extension of my curiosity in the world. So uh, uh, two weeks ago, I was recording my audiobook, and I learned that I learned just exactly how what margin Amazon takes <laughs> 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 for every audiobook that you sell. Mm-hmm. And I decided, you know, I want to own my own audiobook. I'm going to produce my own audiobook. I'm going to own my own audiobook. I'm going to create my own media company so that I can produce and own my own audiobook. And what I plan to do next for Z Speak is to create a podcast series, my own podcast series, right? Focused on Gen Z. Mm-hmm. And so my media company can then also produce my podcast series. And so to me, these are all very exciting things. Now, as you look ahead to my life, how much free time does that leave me? In the last two weeks, I've now created a third company, essentially, a media company, and I'm now talking about taking on a podcast series. Um, but it's work that I'm so passionate about. At mm-hmm. this point in my life, there's almost nothing more exciting to me than speaking to young people and putting their ideas and their thoughts and their contributions out into the world. 
So it doesn't feel like work to me. So that's yeah. part of the reason that I have a hard time, I think, achieving quote unquote work life balance yeah. is because there's such a fusion between the two. Yeah. And it's hard also, as we we're speaking for we record, as business owners are so passionate about what we do, we love what we do. And it's hard to stop and switch off sometimes. Oh, I certain, certainly struggle with it as well. I've had to put things in place to work less, which uh, my chocolate Labrador helps me with. And my, <laughs> and eight, my year old, <laughs> eight year old daughter and- as well. Yeah. And and my goal certainly is to expand, you know, is, is certainly in the in the relatively near future to continue to evolve to a place as I get older where I do have more work, work-life balance. One of the things that I'm really working on right now, and I think that probably a lot of um, business owners, particularly in a um, consulting space like mine work on, is that for much of the last 19 years, I have been more a workhorse than a thought leader. Yep. You know, I've, I've led a lot of the work mm. um, or certainly overseen a lot of the work. Mm-hmm. And what I would really like to do moving forward, and this is a mindset shift for me is, and this is what I'm working on currently is bringing on more people to lead more of the work and be able to evolve to a place where I'm doing thought leadership, right. Where I'm speaking where I'm writing and other people are doing the day-to-day work yeah. of it. Yeah. And that will allow me to bring more work-life balance in. But that's, you know, that's that's a big switch too when you've spent your career doing the work. Yes. Mm. Pulling yourself out of the work and doing the thinking and the speaking and the writing, which is really fun and really exciting to me as I think about that. But that's a big evolution. That's it a is. big transition that I'm I'm in the process of probably moving to. How much professional development have you invested in yourself over the years? You know, my professional development was really working with the amazing kick-ass people at Leo Burnett and Publicis and BBDO those first 10 years. I mean, I was working with the most creative, the smartest, the most incredible people. Um, I couldn't have had better training during that decade. Um, And so that really was the that was really the development work that allowed me to launch my entire career, I would say. And then for me, the other part of it is just being really immersed in culture. You know, I'm just a student of culture. I'm a student of humanity. So I'm constantly reading, you know, one of my favorite books of the past year was Sapiens, right? Which a lot of people read, but, you know, really books that continue to focus on who we are as humans, how we continue to evolve, how our culture continues to evolve, those things just really inspire me and continue to broaden my perspective. I also think that of what I do, travel. Yeah. You know, we like travel is so underrated in terms of its value, a professional value to us. Yep. Mm. Right. Having that perspective. Yes. Having that perspective, especially in the kind of work that I do. So you know, I should really write off all of my all of my fun travel <laughs> because it does. It expands my perspective. It mm. makes me better at what I do. And have you had mentors or coaches along the way? So I hired a, um, I'll give a shout out. Kelly Sheets is her name. Um, She's here in the U.S. She's in Oregon. Um, I hired her as a career coach, but she's really, as it turns out, a life coach, career coach um, four or five years ago. And Global Mosaic was doing really, really well. I mean, we couldn't take on all the work that we were, everything was going great. And yet I felt, I was at about the 15 year point and I felt like I wasn't as enthused by it as I used to be. And so I was trying to figure out what that meant and what I should do next. And that's really when I learned that we as humans are evolving all the time, right? Mm. So if we're a business owner, and our business is essentially still doing the same thing that it was doing 14 years ago, 15 years ago, chances are we have evolved as a person during that time, Mm. right? Our passions have continued to evolve. Our interests have continued to evolve. And so although when I founded it in 2002, it was really in lockstep with who I was and exactly what I wanted to be doing every day. um, It turns out 15 years later, I had evolved and it was not quite matching up with who I was anymore. Right. And so that evolution, I mean, that work that I did with her really were the foundations for me creating Z speak and ultimately writing the book, right. It was really, how do I continue to evolve into an area 
of culture that feels um, like it has so much forward momentum and that I have so much passion for and that I even think about as a bit of a legacy project, frankly, at this point in my life right? Speaking on behalf of this generation, elevating the voices of, the gen- of this generation, elevating the platform for this generation, again, I really think has an important impact for how corporations will, um, will be structured in the future, what corporate priorities will be in the future, what government priorities will be in the future, how our educational institutions will serve students in the future, given their evolving needs and orientation. Um, so, so that was really, really important work. And I would, I would really recommend to any business owner, if you are any entrepreneur, if you're at a point where you just feel like you need a little nudge, you're not feeling as passionate as you were about what you're doing. You're not exactly sure how to evolve, right? No matter how smart you are, <laughs> no matter how thoughtful you are, having that outside perspective, somebody call us on our shit. Yep. And she did. She's the one who actually called me on my shit and said, she said, you are in our very first meeting. She said, you are so heady. Mm. She's the one who said, you're like a stick figure. You're like the stick body with this giant head <laughs> and, you, and you are smart and you're strategic, yep. but you let your head solve for everything. Mm. Mm. That's good. Mm. And you need to get into your heart more and you need to think about where your passion still is. Yes. You've lost some of that passion. Get mm you know, re re engage with that passion and what your passion is now at this point. How long and how often were they meant those mentor sessions? And are you still doing that now? Um, no, but I worked with her for probably about three months. Yeah. Um, and I would also say, just invest the money, just yeah. invest the damn money. You know, mm. she's good. Anyone who's really good mm. is worth, worth the money. I mean, their time, mm. their time is, is, is is valuable mm. right yeah um so i it was a couple thousand dollars a month for those i would say approximately three months and we had you know a big a big zoom for a couple hours long right yeah. once a week and then there was all kinds of individual work that i did in between mm-hmm. where she would give me prompts she'd give me things to think about she'd give me work to do and then i would come back and that would be those would be the inputs for the next week's zoom yeah um yeah. So it's time incredibly and money incredibly well spent. I wouldn't be where I am right now if, if it wasn't for that work I had done with her, I think, four years ago. Do you have a board of directors or advisors? I don't have an official board of directors, but I have advisors mm-hmm. that are made up of very senior business people, um, senior leaders in culture who I meet with, and they both help me make decisions on the business. And they also helped me to really be tapped into um, some of the drivers of cultural evolution that are happening in different areas of society. All right, Emery, what are our final five questions? What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? I think it's the inner bully. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and again, I'm sure that you have lots of guests who speak to that, but I think that it cannot be said enough because... I have found that when I have been honest about that and when I have told people, people look at me from the outside and they say, you know, you've been running this multi-million dollar business for 19 years. Now you started a second business. Now, now you first time author and it's it's projected to be a bestseller, blah, 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 blah. Everything must be great from the inside. And when I say no, I still wake up every morning and the inner bully says, what are you doing writing a book? What are you doing starting a new company? It never goes away. The voice never goes away for me. And you just need to banish it. You need to exile. Mm. You need to ignore it. Well, it's part of what makes us human, isn't it? Having that in It is. Absolutely. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most? Um, I loved um, Daniel Pink, A Whole New Mind. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you read that. No, I haven't yet. No, it's on the list Daniel Pink is fantastic, right? So he he really talked about he talked about how in and at this point is probably 10 years old, maybe, maybe older than that, but fantastic, incredible, transformative book for me. He really talks about how we're in this age, this information age, where there's so much data. There's so much data and there's so much information. He kind of asks the question: does it make us better? Yeah. And what and what do we do with all of it? And he talks about how increasingly right? That we kind of, we went through the, you know, the 
agricultural age and we went through the industrial age and you know we've gone through the information age right and that now we're evolving to this place where we need people who can make sense of all the information we need people who can still look at us as humans and say so what does this all mean for us hmm. what is this for our evolution and who can still engage in storytelling and who can still connect with us as you know, people that are made of flesh and bone and not just numbers in some quant study somewhere. And so what's really important to me is all the work that I do with clients, again, is really trying to, to, to get back to the flesh and bones of who we are and how we're evolving. And when I give a presentation, I think of myself as a storyteller, right? You're, we're telling stories about how we're evolving and why that matters. And we're making sense of all the data and all the information. Otherwise, it just becomes information paralysis. I think we all live through that every day. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Um, I do not have time to listen to <laughs> podcasts or do any professional development right now. I have nothing contri to contribute to that question. I'm sorry. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Well, there I would say, and I guess I've covered this already too, so I'm sorry we're coming back at this point to some things we've already talked about. But for me, it really is about remaining too, true to your initial vision and your initial intention in whatever way that makes sense to you, whether it's meditation, whether it's a vision board, whether it's a big giant mission or vision above your desk. Finally, my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? I would tell myself not to be afraid to be big in the world. I think that we all underestimate our potential to be big. We all envision ourselves as smaller than we need to. And actually, my favorite quote is a Marianne Williamson quote which I don't know if you know this one, no. you know, this quote, no. I'm actually, you know what I'm walking over right now. I have my vision board right here and uh -huh. it is, read it, out. it is, it is on my vision board. And I'm going to read this to you. This quote is, Oh, excuse me. This quote is, and my vision board just fell off my wall. <laughs> my vision board is our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure it is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your plain small doesn't serve the world. Hmm. It goes on to say, and when you allow yourself to be big in the world, you give others permission to be the same. So that's what I would say on day one. I would have said to myself, you are bigger than you think you are. Don't be afraid to be big in the world. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Anne-Marie. That was, that was re a really good uh, chat. I'm, I'm now full of energy. I, I think I'll have to have two less coffees today. That was <laughs> brilliant. No, um, and congratulations on your journey and your success as well um, with your team and your business partner. I think it's, it's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Troy. Such a fun conversation. Yeah. Appreciate you listening to my journey. Thank you. <laughs> And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 